You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Like I had not MDMA until last year. <laughs> you fucking love it. You've mentioned off and round off about five different drugs here today. Yeah, I, 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 do. I love MDMA. You're starting to fucking get me excited, man. Again. <laughs> so sorry. I'll end up bang on the bag again. <laughs> <laughs> the same way fucking you do, fucking hanging out my ass. I started so well that I was sure I was going to be the best thing in stand up, and it gave me a bit of a, a tendency, a bit of a prick. Um, and then when it all went away, I was I didn't like who I was and then when it all went away like it kind of reset me a little bit and then with this gig there was no pressure it was just a gig there was no ambition to be anything more than it was I, I did the DMC about two weeks before that first lockdown and I think if I hadn't done that and kind of it, it's been sent down that path that lockdown illusion what I, I identified myself as would have fucking killed me I think my brain just goes just kill yourself it'd be easier just fucking kill yourself. Just, just why don't you just kill yourself? Just kill yourself. It'd be that. It'd be a lot easier. Um, that little fucking weird voice. What happened? Ah, oh, fucking! Don't get me started. Boom! We're on. We on. And I'm, I looked at the camera there like a fucking <laughs> got all fast looking at. And today's right, guest, mate. comedian Paul Smith, how are you, brother? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Good, mate. Flying high, bro. <laughs> you're flying. Clearly, mate, you're sitting across from the man. But love your stuff. It was actually my sister and brother in law put us on to you. So you need to watch this guy, Liverpool. He's and so I was, I, I didn't even, I seen you followed me on Instagram. I was like, fucking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that watch this and that. And I was like, I was watching it. I was like, it's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> but the one where uh, you were slating it, uh, you get so many busies, mate, coming into your show. Ah, mate. I know people think and I it, set that shit up and I, fu yeah. I promise you, I fucking don't. But it was, uh, I was like, that's funny, man. It's, it's not like a, is that your full sketch? Like, interacting with the crowd? Nah, do you know what it is, right? I, people get that confused about this. Like, if you come, all, they're all shot in hot water. I don't know if you've been, it's the best club. And uh, basically, about 10 years ago, I started hosting for them. So, like, I, I fell out of love with comedy, to be honest. And I was just like, fucking, couldn't be arsed with it, travelling around. My head fell off with it a little bit. And then they were just like an open mic night on a Sunday night. So the, I went down, I fucking went down pissed one day. I hadn't done comedy for about a year. Forgot all my fucking jokes, got up. And I was like, oh, fucking hell. So I had to, like, start bouncing off the audience. And then I just had fun doing it. So they were like, we need a host. So I'd done a couple for them and then they just said, carry on doing it. So all those videos, like, they're me hosting the show. So there's there's me and then there's normally like three acts on or there'll be more. The first videos that went out, there was like, there was, don't you ever used to film on a Monday? And there was like fucking 10, there was like 10 acts on and I'd just have to just go on in the middle and he didn't even film me. They just film, they had like people with cameras in the audience. So they'd be filming, when I was on, they'd be filming the audience, you know, for like cutaways and people yeah. laughing and that. And it was only that I got lucky because some fella fucks off in the middle of the... As I'm coming on, he fucks off. So I had to wait and talk to someone. And I just got a bit where this, this, this lad was a drug dealer. is one of the most famous ones. Because he was just like fucking... He said he worked at Jag and he had a fucking big watch on and he fucking drove a range. And I went, you defo self you <laughs> And uh, it just went mad. So they started filming me then. So there's loads of interactive stuff. And I've been mm -hmm. dead lucky with that because... You don't see it on the telly. You just don't see it anywhere. Every comedy club in the country has got an MC or a host and some amazing ones. But... It, it, the boss thing about it is it's like I do a show every year which has material and stories and stuff like that and I love doing that side of it as well uh, and you do need that side of it to kind of when you go out on tour and you're in a big theatre you do need that kind of big show element to it but I do love the bouncing off the audience and not in, like, in a comedy club environment yeah. and because of that I've been able to get loads of stuff out I think I've got like fucking 200 hours of stand up on the fucking internet I think it must be a world record I don't know. I haven't actually checked, but I think I can't see how anyone's got more stand up on the internet than me. But it's class though, because it's now viewed hundreds of millions of times. Like it's yeah. unbelievable. That it just shows you what can happen just with a bit of consistency and just yeah. keep pushing. But before we get into everything, brother, I always go back to the start for my guests. <laughs> Where you grew up and how it all began? Uh, I grew up in a place called Canny Farm, which is Stockbridge Village, but it's like just on the edge of Liverpool. Bit of a rough area. As, it's so shit actually well not, I don't say shit it's, got, it, it's one of them shit holes with boss people do you know what I mean um, where the best people come from uh, but it's 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 a rough gaff there's a there's a Channel 4 programme called Utopia 
and he had to find like a dystopian fucking I and he, he picked the flats that I grew up on so I was like I, I remember watching it thinking fucking that looks familiar and then some fucking just some little fucking rough ass kid in like the future I was like shit that's where I grew up um, so that's where I'm from I, I can't even say it, I mean as I said it's a rough background but I can't really say I had a bad upbringing or not like that I was just living with my man it was fucking sad it's just um I got the pistol out of me a lot when I was a kid and I think that <laughs> why I, think th I don't know it's just fucking growing up ginger kid fucking horrible teeth uh, making up for the teeth now bro <laughs> up for the teeth now um, it's one of them things isn't it you just you, you, I'm not a fighter me so you need to learn to fight so you need to you learn to take the piss you know what I mean and I think I learned to take the piss and make people laugh and then people liked having me around then and I was a bit of a pothead and stuff like that Yeah. and that's kind of a, I, th I think that's where where the skill the skill kind of originated from and I think that's why I'm quite comfortable for some reason I always say this about people and like you've done comedy you know like there's a lot of people come on to you and you, you get it oh, fucking I'm funnier than you I'm funnier than you and you go all right then we'll just fucking we'll do it then do you know what I mean and so if we're sat in the pub a lot of people are funnier than me like they'll say because they're comfortable where they are but there's something about me when I got on a stage I'm more comfortable than pretty much anyone else I've ever seen. I yeah. just because I'll stand there, so I'm just I, I'm able to just kind of relax in that environment, and then the humour can come through me. That's why I can bounce off the audience so well and stuff like that. Do you think that's because of what you went through when you're younger, the kind of teasing, the kind of picking on you? I think so it's just that was the towards that. Yeah, I think it's kind of you had to. I had to become comfortable, as I said, because I wasn't like a hard kid or not like that. I wasn't. I was never going to be a fighter, so I had to become comfortable having that kind of being able to hold the crowd and being able to like be funny a little bit do you know what I mean yeah was that your like defence from pretending that you were okay basically that try to fire back through words yeah. comedy that's all I had that's all I could do was I wasn't mm -hmm. going to be able to fucking hit anyone do you know what I mean every comedian <laughs> I know mate they are fucked up no like, mate there's not one Scotland, comedian but, with fucking um, Gary Falls D Maxwell that I love them to bits, yeah. but they're fucking mental. They're, they are <laughs> mental, mate. And I done comedy and stand up, and it's fucking so hard. You've got it's to be so fucking. Hard. You've got to be broken somewhere yeah. to want to just even because it's most people. Most people would find it absolutely disgusting just standing there, especially those points of tension that you feel when you're on stage and like when the crowd goes quiet or pulls away from you a little bit. Or like fucking, we just like we just come to the end of December now. Just done all them fucking Christmas gigs with fucking work dudes in where people are all fucked up and half the people don't want to be there like to just want to stand there and have that attention on you is weird like people just i don't know i don't understand why i want to do it and i i can i recognize it most of my closest mates are comedians and we're all fucked in the head yeah we're all absolutely fucked yeah. in the head. we all pretend we're not we all try and act like we're fucking but i think anybody who's especially high in their craft as well you've got to be kind of deluded and kind of psychotic to want to put yourself through that kind of torment because it's mentally draining <laughs> yeah because you're, you're you're a different character we're all different characters anyway i'm a different yeah like, I, I always portray myself as a nice guy and that but once i'm home i don't want to speak to nobody <laughs> mate. i genuinely don't like my job is to speak to people yeah but when i go home i just don't want to speak to nobody if i'm yeah. down a supermarket and i see someone that i know i'll go around the other the side so i don't speak to the cunt <laughs> but if he sees me i'm all loving cuddles what are you doing but it's, it's so i don't know what that is i don't know and I try and think, man, you are fake, James, or you're a fraud. But I just, it's, it's mentally draining because I give so much energy. Yeah. So I was just going to say this. I've come, I, I, we'll get onto this in a little bit because I think we've got a lot of shit, similar interest in this area. But I've been fucking with psychedelics quite a bit yeah. in the last couple of years. Um, and it was so, not something I'd ever, ever really wanted to delve into but for some reason I just felt like it was time in my life and I, had, I, I, I started going into it a little bit and one thing that it really kind of settled for me and was when you're on a stage something I'd always known and I'd never really because I would always been like I'm an atheist don't believe in no shit you know what I mean I was yeah. always felt like I was that way um, but when you're on a stage I've been there so many times and I've said this to comedians and there's no one who can explain it to me in a better way that energy transfer that you just said there's some people who are just conduits for energy and I think that's why we're good at what we do or whatever that's why we're, we're talkers we're good at taking other people's emotions and making people feel a certain way I think that's my main skill um, and when you get on a stage you can feel that audience you can feel everyone in the room doesn't matter if it's 10,000 or 200 or 50 you can feel everyone there and you give and you take and 
basically, I the way I see it when you're doing stand up, the way I do it is anyway, is like you kind of t- you you drawing all the negative energy through you and pushing positive out and giving it back to them. Do you know what I mean? So as you, it's it's it is massively draining. Yeah. Like, I've come off stages sometimes, and. I don't do it anymore. For this the first time I did the Echo Arena, they organised like a meet and greet after it, and I don't mind meeting people after the show and getting pictures and stuff like that. But this fucking meet and greet, man, I, I felt like I was gonna fucking have a nervous breakdown, and I'm trying to hold it together. But I, that was I, I had so much more anxiety doing that because I'd just given everything that I had to this fucking nine thousand people. And I come off the stage and I had to stand there and just be like, hiya, oh, hiya, oh, and just like making small talk and chit chat with people. Yeah. And it's not particularly difficult. And to them, it's not difficult. And it's not like anyone was doing anything wrong, but I just felt like, oh, I felt like it near killed me doing it. And mm-hmm. I, I just I walked away from it. I was like, I'm never doing that again. It's I'm never doing panic that again. Panic attack, basically. Yeah, yeah but almost. Because it was just like, I just don't think I had anything left. I feel like it was just such a fucking jarring experience to have that much energy. Because I had like 9,000 people scream at me, do you know what I mean? And it, it was such positive, it was a lot of love, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's it's hard to take that sometimes. It's hard to take that. One thing I've, I I struggled a lot with, um, and I've seen a few people for it, with like imposter syndrome, because everything happened so quick. And you might have had the same thing, I don't know, uh, how like your egos handled it all, kind of being thrust into the limelight and uh, uh, loads of people recognise you when you when you go around. And people do... I imagine you get the same way where people, when people bump into me in the streets, it's always positive. I never really get anyone, yeah. like, 999 times out of a thousand, it'll be like, oh, people are dead happy to see you. Mm-hmm. And they just want a little picture or just want to have a little, they just want to say hello. They don't even particularly want a lot of your time. Yeah, I, 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 that's what I wanted. Yeah. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be known. And then when I was started making transitions by no drink, no drugs, no gambling. Yeah. Once I started, because it means it's been small steps and it's yeah. gradually, it's not just been, you see these kids on Love Island, then boom, they're yeah. mega famous in the UK from a certain demographic. But for me, it was kind of small steps, but I kind of craved it because I thought it would be the answers I needed for all the pain. I thought it would have took away all the pain. I thought being in the newspapers and interviewing successful people would have been loving it. I thought I'd be more happier now than I would ever be, but yet I, I tend to battle more now because everything that I've craved, I realise it's not what makes me happy, yeah. which is weird. So now I have to change it all again because everything I've set goals to get, I'm achieving, but I'm still battling like a, a brand new Range Rover Sport and um, nice clothes, nice holidays, big numbers, great guests, and yet I still wake up and I'm not happy. Yeah. And I think, cause I remember getting the Range Rover and I think I drove along and I was trying to force myself to be happy. I'm trying to, <laughs> genuinely, I'm trying yeah. to be, be happy because like, I've got a vision board and the motors are up in the wall and the houses, everything. And, and the majority is fucking, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's been hurt in like three, four years. And and I thought, man, I'm not happy. So then I had to change it all. I got rid of the motor again, um, downgraded. And uh, I'm starting to do more things. I'm starting to, my mobile phone's a massive thing, 10 hours to 12 hours a day. I put that down to four hours again. Yeah. I feel, I automatically feel thing. better because on your mobile phone it raises your anxiety and depression straight away that's a, a scientifically proven that that's it's a depressant so for me to, to change that because when I post something if I get a post 5,000 likes next one gets 2,000 I feel as if nobody loves me anymore <laughs> I know exactly and it makes me mean. sad and I'm thinking James it's, an, it's, it's not real it's fake love anyway yeah but now I just I just had to change my strategies again over the last few months because I don't want to bullshit people my platform's getting bigger and I thought that everything that I created would be everything and it's and it's not it's kind of made things not worse but it makes me a pressure did getting rid of the car make you feel better yeah 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 it's, you know, this is so weird because a few years a couple of years ago i'm coming around on this right i've just got i've just bought a lambo right orange bright orange lambo uh-huh. right and I, about two years ago three years ago two maybe three i bought uh I had a Peugeot 108 and I, I, I just started making money and, I, and then I got a, 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 an E-Class Merc and I loved it. And then I fucking just went mad and I bought a GT 63S Mango Blue fucking, fucking 4 litre V8 twin turbo fucking mad thing, right? Just bought it on an impulse. Just fuck, I want that, right? Went in the Merc, it was there, I want it. Um, stupid amount of money and I got it and exactly the same thing. Didn't make me happy, right? And I was driving around in it and I felt like it was that it was that walking fucking everyone was looking at me. It was that walking kind of imposter syndrome. Mm. 
and exactly the same thing I had for three months and got rid of it downgraded again because fucking to a car that no one noticed because yeah. it's just fucking done me heading and at the time I was like I was telling everyone I just didn't like it it wasn't for me I didn't like the car but it was that it was that kind of I didn't like I felt like a show off in it right and I felt like I didn't deserve it or I didn't want it or whatever there was something about that to me and then to, going on this journey with the psychedelics and stuff and the people I've been speaking to when you when when I've done this stuff, I've experienced what they call ego death or whatever. And that was something I always kind of, I was looking for it a little bit because I thought, in, in my head I was like, oh, I don't want to get a fucking, the worst thing for me was to be a big, I like to, people see me as a real person, I like to think that about myself. I'm, if you come up to me in the street, I'll treat you exactly the same as anyone else. I've always been that way, I'm a friendly person. Um, and I didn't want to start, because with a bit of fame, start going to fucking being a knobhead, and I think that's what that car done for me, and that's the way I was seeing myself. And then I had this, all these experiences, and experienced the ego death, and I was thinking, there we go, ego death, that, that's what I need to do, I don't want the ego, I want, like, I'm trying to get rid of it, or the dark part of myself, the part of me that wanted the fucking, the designer clothes, or the fucking bright blue cars, and fucking, or, or whatever it was. Um, and then I spoke to someone about it, and he was like, because what I found was I was having these intense psychedelic experiences coming out of a few, few days feeling amazing, maybe a week or two weeks feeling incredible, feeling like dead zen, not materialistic. And then it was just creeping back in the phone, everything else was coming back and all that nonsense was just seeping back in. And it was seeming to come out or it was bouncing back worse. And I was going up fucking, I went and bought myself a fucking Rolex on a whim, just a Rolex that I didn't want. I didn't I didn't like it. Like if I had it on my wrist and I felt uncomfortable, do you know what I mean? And I was thinking, what the fuck? Are, why, why am I doing all this? And then I spoke to a few people about it and I, I don't know if you've ever read any Carl Jung or... Yeah. Yeah, so I, he talks about the shadow and I think all that side of me, it's there, it's a part of me. There's a show-off part of me that I can't get rid of because it's a it's necessity to what I do. Like there's definitely a a fucking part of me that wants to be looked at and wants that status and stuff like that. Uh, and I was trying to push it away or trying to eradicate it from my personality. Um, and it was just lashing back. It was just lashing back and lashing back at me. So someone said to me, "You need to like what you need to what you need to understand is is that that ego is not you. It's not you. It's you need to take a step back from it." You're all you sit behind all this, and you it's all you, you, it's all part of you. So you need to be feeding that kind of stuff. So what I've what what I've learned to do now is kind of feed me ego a little bit in a help. I'm trying to learn to feed me ego a little bit in a healthier way, and can, in a controllable way. So then I can do the more spiritual stuff, and and that's not going to lash back at me. If, if that makes any sense, yeah, of course, because it feels I feel guilty. Exactly. I do all this homeless work, and I'm an ambassador for mental health. But yeah, I'm thinking I'm spending this on a watch or putting yeah. this on a holiday. And I try and speak to people about it and they go, you've earned that. You've yeah. worked hard, but I still don't feel it. it makes me happy. I don't feel as if I find my completion there, a fulfillment. Like yeah. I, when I'm out walking, I'm, I'm trying to enjoy my times with the kids. But if I'm with my kids as well, sometimes I'm on my phone because I'm thinking, I need to get that guest. That'll bring a certain amount of views, bring money in that way. I can do that, I can do that. But I'm, there's no point in doing all that, getting all this thing and I'm not enjoying it. Yeah. So if I've still got ego if I want to be the biggest in the world. Yeah. My plan is biggest in Scotland, UK, world. Yeah. And I'll achieve that in three, yeah. five years. Like, yeah. It's not a problem. I know I will. I'm so confident. Yeah. But part of me, that's still a bit psychotic. Because what? why can't I be happy just enjoying the process they always tell you enjoy the process and not concentrate on the finishing line yeah. I'll finish I'll create something hit the goal and then I've created another one straight away so yeah. I'm, I'm not enjoying it so that's to just come back and enjoy the journey I'd, I've been listening to more audio books again and uh, meditation is very key for me going over affirmations to tell me yeah. that I'm good enough and this and that but if we're constantly working to be the best and, and hit big audiences there's something in us that only feels good if we're hitting big audiences yeah. and and I think that's okay. I think it's okay it's to have drive. I'm just coming to terms with the fact that it's definitely okay. Or do we try and convince ourselves that? But no, really it's not well, going to make us happy. I, I th well, I don't... I think happy is a very loaded word and I think it's very... It's a word that... It's it's the unattainable because what you're really looking for, like what these things will give you is... Uh, moments are like dopamine hit, much like internet and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but it's it's... What I've found, and the reason I went out and bought a bright orange Lambo, which is the most fucking stupid car I could buy, is it, it was me going to me, I do deserve that. I've worked hard and I, I make a lot of people happy. So why 
why I, I I deserve that and I deserve to drive around in it and that that's fine and I know what I know what I do on the side. I know the charity stuff and all that. I don't I don't talk about it too much, but like I know all that stuff. I know I'm good with my kids. I'm a good dad. I do everything else. Everything else in me in my life is fine. And I know as well that I'm looking after myself meditation wise and I'm doing all that kind of stuff. So in order to feed my ego and give that, I just give a little bit. I just I let it. I, I, I'm trying to treat it as its own entity. So I, it's fucked up, though, isn't it? That it's absolutely of fucked up. That it is but crazy. I, that. I don't see it's. I've tried for years to not have it, yeah. and it's not possible. I just don't see it. It'll ju- it, it pushes back, and I think that's when I start fucking drinking too much and abusing yeah. stuff. And it, it, it's trying to fucking because you're basically telling yourself that a big part of yourself is shit. Do you know what I mean? And it, it's mm-hmm. not good enough, and that's where all those feelings come from. I think, but it's not. It's just a necessary part of you yeah. that it, that you need to be. The it's person the game you are. we're in. It's the world we're yeah. in. Like, I've thought about just moving into the woods. Yeah, just mate, I have that Growing a beard, growing the pubes and fucking wearing a big robe and, <laughs> and just forgetting everyone. But then how how can I then, I how can I help everyone. people? How can I change the game if I'm not in the game? This is just a big game to me anyway. Mm-hmm. It's just a game that I'm trying to figure out the puzzles and the pieces to put them all together. But if anything, the pieces are just getting more scrambled <laughs> because the more deeper I'm getting in, the more understanding I'm getting to understand life, the more questions I'm asking about certain things yeah. in my mind... It's just have you ever had have you ever had the big spring clean in your house? Yeah. It, I'll do it this week hour, before I, New Year. When, I, when about an hour in your house is fucked. It's yeah. a shithole, do you know what I mean? Mm. I feel like that's where that's probably where we are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it's good to ask the questions, but sometimes I think we can search too much and, and forget to live. Like why am I give like people say, Oh great more than that, beautiful, but I'll get one asshole who'll say, You forgot yourself and part of me will think at night I have forgot myself. <laughs> well that's fucking <laughs> I I put that fucking car online and it was amazing how much positivity I got for yeah, it. Like, you've earned that, you've worked you've hard. It, yeah. you've hard. <laughs> and then I, took, I was driving out of town and some little fucking gobshite student was like, uh, he, he said, you, he was like, you've got a little dick. <laughs> like that. And he was walking in the rain and he was like, oh, you got a little dick. And I just went, all right, mate. And I drove my car off and I was thinking, fucking little car. I wanted to, I wanted to turn around. I was like, I don't know why I haven't got a little dick. I know exactly how big my dick is. It's above average. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to go on fucking, because in his head, I'm compensating for, I mean, I probably am compensating for stuff with that car, but it's not that. And I wanted yeah. to go, I wanted to go and have the debate with him because I hate when people feel like they know you and they don't, or people feel it just at that glance. And we all do it. We all, I probably do that about other people as well. Yeah. But I know exactly what you mean. It's that, that, that one person fucking, I have about 15,000 people get reacting positive to it and then one reacting badly to it. And I was like, fuck, yeah. it, and it got me for a few hours. And but we all want to be loved, we all want to be accepted. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. We all try and portray ourselves as good, honest, hardworking guys. But when, when you break it all down, we just don't know what the fuck is going on. Mm. We're never going to figure it out. I don't think. I'm trying to, but what is it I'm trying to figure out? Life is a beautiful thing. Your time is fucking priceless. Mm. It's a, it's so priceless. But yeah, I'm constantly on the road. Should I be spending so much time in the road because I've got my family back in Glasgow? Or... Am I running away or do I use it as an excuse because I'm working to provide from them to give them nice things? Like it's a constant battle. This mm. isn't just a battle externally, it's a battle internally. Mm. Like I don't know if I'm making the right decisions. And no matter what I do in life, no matter when I was active and doing bad things, I had those thoughts. But now it's the thoughts have become more it's like a minefield, man. It's like constant. Yeah. I question everything, what I'm doing, who I speak to, what I buy, is it an investment for the future? But and then I try and tell my kids money isn't everything, but yet I'll go out and spend fucking 10 grand on a holiday. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I just contradict myself. And then I'll go home and think, you're a fraud. <laughs> I think you're so full of shit, man. Like, you're so full of shit. Like, you post motivational uh, stuff online and I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm not even feeling happy when I'm posting that. No. So then I think, what the fuck am I all about? It's, it's, it's nuts. Like my method of thinking is fucking nuts. And I, and I, and that's why these even speaking to you, it's like therapy sessions. Mm. Everybody, I feel as if I, I put my emotions and everything into it because it's I need to release. Yeah. Because everybody's kind of on the same wavelength. If you actually sit everybody down who I've interviewed, you'll kind of see that everybody's got a very small connect, well, very big connection to each other. That mm. we just don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. And it's such a fucking weird experience. How much? How much weed did you smoke when you were younger? A lot of weed. I mean, do you know what, right? Uh, 
I, I have this discussion. She might not thank me for saying this, but I mean, my missus is lad. It's just started like for 50, 60, just turned 16, just started dabbling a little bit. And I had quite a frank, honest on, because I'm not going to be a fucking hypocrite and say, oh, don't do that because I, I never did that. I did it. And although I think I went too far with it and it had a negative effect because I even, I'd, all I did for about fucking 10 years was smoke weed. That was me for life just sitting in the house smoking weed. It was shit. Um, but I don't necessarily think weed's a bad thing. I just think, uh, much like, I think people just use it wrong, much like alcohol or whatever. And I think some people have, like, I'm quite an extreme personality, so, like, I, I, it's very easy for me to take things too far. I fucking, even even a fucking packet of biscuits, I can't have one, do you know what I mean? I'll just, I'll eat the whole fucking thing. Yeah. Like, I, I, I've had to fucking, one, I, 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 I've been struggling with drink quite a bit recently. Why? Um, just fucking drinking too much. Just I, it got to the. I, I've never had a problem with drinking because it's always been weed and stuff. But then I, I, I kind of managed to. I've I've got a good relationship with weed now, and I use it. I, I understand as I use it as a tool, and I understand exactly when I need to use it, and I don't use it any other time. I vape it, so I don't get that nicotine addiction and shit like that. And I'm very good with weed now, but I feel like just there's parts of me that like this is why I try not to like ever really get too into cocaine and shit like that because I try and distance myself from it a little bit because even with the drink like I, I tell myself oh, I, I like I like a nice whiskey and now because I can afford it I'm, I'm drinking fucking 18 year old whiskey thinking it because it's 18 year old whiskey I can drink a bottle of it a day do you know what I mean mm. and it's fine and it's fucking not fine it's still fucking whiskey do you know what I mean and I'm fucking I'm sat there just I mean, my kids are in bed. I'm in the house alone, and I've done fucking half a bottle of whiskey, and I'm I, I, I'm sat there thinking, what the fuck am I going to do here now? If something goes wrong here, and I have to take one of these kids to Aussie, what the fuck are you going to do, yeah. you half cunt? Well, that tells me you're not in a good place, bro. Well, it tells me I'm not in a good place from time to time, and then fucking then I have that fucking that, that that's when the warning signs go off, and those <laughs> impulsive behaviours and going out and spending too much money and shit like that. Those kind of looking for those little head hedonistic that's when like th those signals flag up and I'm like I need to change something here and yeah. I've been I, I, I just go through cycles of it me I go through towards the fame and the attention and because it's more pressure it's more added pressure it's a lot of pressure yeah. and people don't realise that I'm nowhere near the levels I'm going to get to mm. and I'm fucking stopped people talk to me because they watch my podcast they feel as if they know me mm. and, I, and I feel like a dick because I don't know who they are yeah. and I think how do I know him and then they go oh it's because and I'll go oh yeah 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 and I'll give them so much time and then I go away and it it's not that you're being bad, but I just, it becomes so fucking draining. Yeah. Like, and that's weird. I crave that. I thought that would be the, the, the cure to all my problems, mm. being successful, being well-known, and it's fucking making them worse. But I'm not, thankfully, like, I've, I'm still foot in the ground, not drinking, not taking gear, I'm not mm. gambling, I'm not doing the shit that I would hide behind. So you need to be careful because that half bottle of whiskey then turns into a bottle, then it turns into a fucking quarter of weed, and then it turns into whatever it is you're chasing. Same as the psychedelics, like... For me, it's still a form of an escape mm. because I know people there, I smoked weed for 12 years and that was the hardest thing. That and the gambling was so painful to mm. stop, man. Like, the nightmares coming off the weed was fucking unbelievable, yeah. man. Like, the, you, just, you go psychotic, man. And with the psychedelics and I done the ayahuasca and I felt, man, like, is this just another form of me escaping reality? I've, I've so I question that as well. And I'm still in a great place. A lot of majority of people who took it slip back. It's not a case that you take this medical medicine and then you, you see fucking rainbows and butterflies and you're skipping down the road you need to work on yourself coming back so i didn't want to sell people that dream of this is going to cure all your problems because it doesn't you've still got to work on yourself yes you see things and maybe it opens things up in the brain i don't know but i read there's one where you go seven days in a dark tomb and just nothing but darkness and after three four days the brain releases an actual dmt so i like that for everything internal the scientists done a study on alcohol drugs psychedelics and sex they rigged the brain up and marked the brain out a 10 and the response to it and how good it felt alcohol was an eight sex was a nine psychedelics were a nine the only thing it was a 10 was uh, breathing techniques and meditation and that was the only one you never got to come down so you mm. can get to these higher states from meditation and yeah. you feel better and it lasts longer yeah. so all Have that you done other, any of that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I do all the cold water stuff. Yeah. I, I, so I, I, I add yeah. Wim Hof and stuff and um, people are always offering me DMT. I'm just scared if I start fucking taking that 15 minute hits, I'll be on it every day. <laughs> do you know now, what I mean? I, well, the DMT is a weird one. 
because and I, again I don't want to condone this or say that anyone should do it because it's up to yourself what you do um, but the DMC is the first thing I hit and it changed my life because it's it's the thing that it gives you such a genuine sense of something else there and I think it really helped me because I, I did the DMC about two weeks before that first lockdown and I think if I hadn't done that and kind of it, it's been sent down that path that lockdown and losing what I identified myself as would have fucking killed me. I think I think it would have done me. I think I'd have ended up in a really bad place. So I'm kind of thankful for it. Um, with the, but I did the same thing. I, I went a bit, not far, but I went a bit showy off with it because I was being a bit evangelistic with it and I was telling my mates about it and I, I had something else and I was like, I have some of this, I have some of this. Um, and I hit it a bit too much and whatever's there, like believe this or don't believe it, it's up to yourself, but whatever's there, I truly believe you connect with something else that's there. And they, it told me off. It literally fucking, it, 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 I was in a corner in a ball. My mates are watching me do this. I went too far with it and they were like, don't fuck about with this. And I just haven't had it since because I was like, it was, it was not terrifying, but it felt like you were a toddler being told off by your ma, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it was that kind of fear, do you know what I mean? The fear of your mum, do you know what I mean? Like I, like I had never fucked with my mum and that's how I kind of related it. Um, and I, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of time for mushrooms and I have a lot of time for, but I think you are right. You've got to, I have had that as well where I'm like, am I just using this to kind of, <laughs> it's that whole thing, going back to what you said before about like, with weed and stuff like that, I, 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 I'm quite positive about these things, but then I do think, fucking hell, am I a fraud? Am I a fraud? Like, do, do I, am I having these mushrooms and then telling people about them? Am I kind of trying to convince myself? Is it, is it some form of escapism? Am I, am I just, do I, do I just want some kind of spiritual spirituality that much that I'm just like attaching things to it? Yeah, I think that's what it is. I think you're trying to convince yourself. Mm. That's what all I've done. There's always an excuse. There's always something. Oh, I'm going to do ayahuasca because I'm making a documentary. I wanted to do it because I wanted to taste something again because I was clean from everything. Yeah. I wanted to use it. Listen, I'm still in a great place, so I can't fault that. Yeah. It was just another form for me to use something. And I don't know, like, I don't have all the answers to it, but my life is going good. I'm doing good things and I'm, I'm staying a clean life, but I still battle up here. I don't think any weed or Valium or DMT or so, takes that pain away. No. But I think it's got to face all your pain straight on, not the whiskey, not the DMT, not the weed, because it sounds like me, you're justifying as well some things and that's where your battle will constantly come across where you'll think, fuck it, I've had a bad day, it's stressful, I've just finished a, a tour or whatever. The first thing you want to do is just forget about it and kind of relax, but it's scary. We use weed or alcohol is a form of relaxation when you've got yoga out there you've got hot yoga you've got breathing techniques you've got cold water therapy yeah. that's as natural as you can be like, there's no better feeling I get after doing the cold water in the ice that feeling for a few minutes is unbelievable mm. it's better than every drug that I've ever experienced I want to do everything as natural as I can be because I don't want to say to people well, I don't if, when I was on the weed if somebody told me to start I'd have told them to fuck off because I needed it through all the family problems I was going through mm. and all the misery and pain. That, that kept me alive. Weed kept me alive. That was a journey that I had at the time because it kept me alone in the house, smoking joints, and I was safe. I was safe towards myself and I was safe. Other people were safe because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing in my 20s. I was a loose cannon, but the weed kind of suppressed everything. But there comes a stage where I had to face it all and go, Do you know what, I can't smoke this anymore mm. yeah. because I was becoming just a... I wasn't even a functioning addict. I just I wasn't even functioning at all. I was just sitting in my gaff. I was on social media trying to get buds, slipping in the DMs, yeah. just being a fraud and a fake. And then obviously when I started getting the ball rolling, started cutting those things out, life be got, became great. But now I'm doing these other things and I feel as if I've hit a standstill again. So I just need to re reassess, reevaluate, and then shoot for the stars again. And I'll figure it out and you'll figure it out. But you need to be careful that you don't figure it out by doing everything that you're doing outside of thing. you i annoy myself with this because i've 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 done a lot of the things you say I, I i did a lot of wim hof through lockdown i did, a lot, I did yeah. a lot of yoga um and i've got great people around me who are like good at like cold water therapy community and stuff like old crosby beach and everyone jumps in five five and mark uh -huh. scano and it runs awake and it's just there's a lot of people around there like around that kind of community i'm plugged into and i know I know myself, like I've done Kundalini, I've done Wim, Wim Hof and I know how good I feel off doing it and getting in that routine. But just some part of me, and again, it might be a, um, 
it might this is one question I have a lot of I struggle with a lot in my life is it's it's the whole fate kind of am I in control really am I actually in control or am I just on this journey am I, am I just observing it because I do these things sometimes and I'm looking at myself doing it going why are you doing this why are you doing this and then I'm trying to justify it after the fact um I, I, with with the with the, with all the, I know what to do. I know the positive things that I should be doing in my life. I know I know the positive routines and the things that make me genuinely happy. But then I think like sometimes when I slip out of that, I think that's when I'm more creative. Like with what I do, that kind of, and I feel like do I need a little element of that darkness and do I need a little element of that fucking like kind of cat catastrophe in my life to kind of because if I'm too if I'm just too content and too zen, I find myself just dead placid on stage, and I'm just like, well, I'm not, not, I'm not shit, but I'm not as, I'm not as. There's no edge there. Do you know what I mean? There's, I, I, I feel like do I need? Is life just then pushing me to the edge a little bit? Because I know I can get back. Is it pushing me to the edge to, to kind of experience some more of these kind of things so then I can go back and talk and I've got I'm I'm a more interesting relatable person is it my job to like kind of have these experiences and then be able to relate them to people in a funny way so yeah. they, they can understand and maybe it, it helps them on their journey I don't know I don't know about all these yeah, things but again it's try to convince yourself that you need it for your creativity yeah but people find you funny no matter what whether you're on DMT or ayahuasca or whatever <laughs> you've already experienced it so you can still use it as content yeah do you know what but I mean but then I've got to experience the next thing haven't I and the next yeah, thing and the next natural, thing natural cold water therapy how much fucking content could you get out of yeah, swimming in the fucking could. cold water like crazy bastard swimming in their underpants do you know what I mean at five in the morning <laughs> and you think it's good for you like there's no matter what you do you, you'll find a creative edge yeah. anyway again that's that convincing yourself that you need it for that dark you, you're already dark as fuck no matter if you go natural or not we're already dark humoured anyway we're all wired up wrong we're all fucked up deluded <laughs> like no matter what you do in life like it, everything stages well for me anyway it's all became stages now but I want to go to a stage where every year I improve yeah. I don't want to slip back if I was to drink now man it's everything I've created I wouldn't never get it back again yeah. I don't think I'd get out that's how I don't drink yeah. because I, I don't think I would get out because I know how fucking hard that is yeah. to stop and after you get through the first three months six months you start seeing the world differently and you don't act on it as much but if I was to drink again I, I'm gone there's no getting out and that scares the shit out of me yeah. like, because then if I'm doing interviews and they're not becoming as real because then I do feel like a fraud yeah. I do feel like a fake because the drink will lead to the drugs the drugs will lead to the gambling the lying the stealing the cheating and then I'll be doing bad things again to live a life that I can't, can't how fund. do you find you know because you spend a lot of time on the road and it's obviously and there's yeah. no clear routine there that's I struggle with that a lot like when I start touring and I've got, I'm literally in a different place every day. Mm. Uh, I find, like, through lockdown, I found a piece of piss to do all this stuff. I get up in the morning, do a bit of yoga, have a cold shower in the garden, do some weights in the afternoon. I got in fucking incredible shape. But um, it was easy because I had nothing else to do and I had nowhere else to be. Once I get on the road, and again, this is, this is I, I, I'm even listening to myself going, I know you're making excuses because there's ways to do it, but it's just so easy to just, when you're, when you're out and about and you get, you're get in a different place to go, oh, I don't know, I, I can't go to the gym today, like, I've yeah. got up a bit too late or whatever, or I can't, I, I'm not going to go up at six o'clock yeah. in the morning and go, because I've got to do a show tonight and then I won't be able to nap this afternoon, I won't be sharp and it's all that shit. Because you're out your comfort zone, so when I'm down London every week or two, like, there's a gym around the corner, it's like F46 or F, I don't know what it is, but it's like a hit class, 45 minutes. For a year and a half, I've always said I've went there and I've never went once. <laughs> Not fucking once. Every time, I'll take my gym stuff. I'll take everything. It's only around the corner and I'd never seem to go because when I wake up, I'll just sit on my phone and I'll wait for my guests to come. Or, yeah. And then after that, I'll get food and then I'll just go a walk. I'm no routine. I go home bloated and then it takes me about two or three days to get back into a normal routine again. I'll mm. go back to the gym then, but it's time to go back on the road again. So I know these things as well that... I want to be in the best shape of my life. I seem to get there after 46 weeks and to push on for that extra six weeks to really get there, I fuck it. It's like <laughs> self-sabotage. Yeah. It's like, I like I like to like harm myself. It's like a sense of harming, eating bad, feeling not good enough. So I'll sit in a big packet of Doritos and chocolate and I'll sit and watch Netflix and I'll flick through my phone. Mate, I checked my phone stats last night because try I'm trying to come off it this week so I get into the New Year flying last week man I was watching TikTok for over 6 hours fucking hell 6 hours mate 
And I'm fucking thinking, what the fuck am I doing? TikTok's for fucking kids, man. Like, I'm just scrolling and I'm, I remember in my bed, like I couldn't sleep. And I was just obviously just watching fucking loads of videos, six hours. And that was 14 hours on the phone, but six hours were on TikTok. So I'm thinking, uh, that makes me a fraud because to be go levels in this game, and I, I've got so much time I could be putting into other things and learning new crafts and educate myself more because I've done so many interviews I repeat the same shit as well I can only repeat what I know and what I've mm. been through but I need to educate myself more so I can adapt more and give more information because a lot of millions of people watch this stuff so it's mm. to try and give them the right information to maybe give them the steps to change their life I don't want to fool people I genuinely don't but part of me feels like I do still it's part of that's that imposter syndrome mm. people always tell me how I'm amazing I'm going and I think fool you you cunt you don't know half it man yeah. like, you don't know fuck all that and that part of getting the car as well, that it just didn't make me feel happy. And I felt as if I was getting more noticed, and I felt as if people would lose respect for me because I've came from the streets mm. to then created something and being successful. I feel as if then people then change their perception of you that you have forgot where you've came from, and that's fucking weird. And I shouldn't feel like that, but yeah. part of me is that imposter syndrome which kicks in. How were you in school? What you, what you were mean? In school, were you a good kid or nah. hard working? Um, I, was, I was always clever um, and I started well uh, first couple like first couple of years I was a bit of a nerd and I was, but then I was, I'm not going to say fell in with bad people because like my mates in school were good lads and I, we weren't like the fucking hard kids or nothing but we, we just fucking started smoking weed when I was 13 stoners and then yeah just stoners mate and then it was just just fucking about taking the piss out of teachers and just like again I'm not necessarily a bad kid not getting into any trouble with the police or nothing like that but like just fucking I went into half my GCSE stoned and and then come out didn't know what I wanted to do <laughs> wanted to be it told me mad I wanted to be an accountant so she'd buy me a suit because I always wanted a suit uh, got a suit and then went to do this accountancy job for about two months and then just fucked that off um, and then went on to this stupid fucking multimedia course just so I could play games and smoke weed. Um, didn't have a fucking clue. Didn't have a fucking clue what I wanted to do. And I'm kind of... It, that, that, that's a very negative way of saying it. I'm kind of glad because I feel like... Let's say I was a bit more strong with the accountancy thing that, at that time. Or... I, I think there's a lot of pressure on kids and young people now to... I have this plan, I have the whole life planned out and kind of, school doesn't provide enough experiences or it's not geared in a way, it was never geared towards the way I work, it was never geared towards my, me, I'm a very, very visual learner, I'm a very like, I like to, like I end up going back to uni, um, much later on and doing philosophy and I always found that I learned a lot better if I sit and try and read the book, I fucking read the same paragraph about 50 times. It just doesn't fucking go in. But like, that's the beauty of YouTube and stuff for me. Information, I can, information goes in a lot better that way. Or if I sit and have a conversation with someone, I seem to retain information that way. And when I went to uni, that was, you have seminars and you sit and you have a discussion, you argue about stuff. And that's, that seems to, that seems to work a lot better for me. And I just don't seem to do stuff like that. And I know going from back to air kids, like air, the, the, the pressure they're under now to know exactly what they're going to be and what they're under and the fucking the pressure that they're being put under. And I don't want to say, listen, fuck your GCSEs. I fuck my GCSEs up and I've turned out all right. Cause I think I'm, I'm a very marginal case. Do you know what I mean? I've been quite lucky in that regard where I've ended up okay. Um, or about skills that I've kind of, I've, I've, I've been able to, I've been able to use my skills to be successful anyway, yeah. and that won't happen for a lot of people. But I think I don't think you should massively rush to to know to to to, to lunge yourself into something that you're not necessarily going to enjoy, um, because I think that happens to a lot of kids in the end. They end up debted up to fuck, they end yeah. up debted up to fuck going to uni doing something they fucking don't really want to do. And then they come out of it, debted up, and they end up stuck in a job trying to pay for that uni course for the rest of their life, and they're never happy. They're just stuck in a race. Like, as much as we can say that we're not happy and we struggle, at least we have the luxury to be able to to to, to have a lifestyle yeah. that we can do these things and and really we can try to kind of improve ourselves and try all these different things because we have the luxury of time. Do you know what I mean? Mate, can you imagine we were working doing something we didn't like? Just exactly, now, mate, exactly. Be because me. a lot of people are fucking yeah. so stuck in that, and like I have to remind myself of that sometimes. Like yeah. I did comedy for 12, 
12, 13 years before I made it. I was I was making for about seven. I was making a, a, a living. Do you know what I mean? I was scraping by. Um, How did you get into comedy? Uh, I, I did a comedy course. <laughs> Where? <laughs> at Raw Hard Comedy and um, the Royal Court Theatre. I was a graphic designer and I fucking hated it. I worked sitting in an office. Just couldn't. And then, I, to be honest, I was honest. I've, I've always been that kind of self-help book, kind of self-improvement kind of. Mm -hmm. So I was doing all that shit. I was doing a lot of fucking, this is a horrible story actually. I was doing it. Um, I don't know if you've ever read a book called The Game. No. There's a fella called Neil Strauss. Because fucking out, I, I wanted to be able to pick birds up, and um, I got this book because my best mate from school. I was supposed to go in the RAF, and I was about eighteen, and my mate went in, and I fucking shit. I was never done it, um, and he's still in, um, done well. He's like a sergeant, so sort of no, um, and he'd gone into the RAF, and he had this car, and he was living in Cyprus, and he was getting married, and I was flying over for his wedding, and I was feeling fucking shit about myself because I'm fucking still in my in my mum's bedroom, fucking potted. And uh, a fucking fella come on Richard and Judy while I was fucking ironing my clothes to pack in my bag. And he's fucking, uh, he's going on about this fucking little baldy fella, this little nerdy looking dude saying he's fucking black Britney Spears, right? And he, he could tell you how to do it. And I was thinking, fuck off. So I remember watching it. And then I got in the airport and was there in WH Smith and I thought, fuck it. So I got it. And I, mate, and it's not like a necessarily like a how to guide. It's more, a, it's a biography of his. I, he goes with the whole pickup artist and they go out and he was just explaining how to pick women up. So I thought, I, I ended up getting into this stuff for a couple of years. I was trying to go out and like pick women up and it was just all fucking like, it, it, it was like you, you had to like open and demonstrate value and all this shit and it was like explaining approach anxiety why men have approach anxiety from tribal things it was a lot dead interesting stuff fucking horrible it's just psychological fucking it's just it, it's completely learning to be a false person it's so bad for you yeah, manipulation. It's, it's just it's manipulation manipulation it's all affectations it's all learned behaviors it's nothing real and you can't possibly maintain uh, any kind of relationship because it breaks down after about fucking three or four days of someone really spending time with you mm -hmm. and you're like I can't be this person anymore and I'm not the person they thought I was and you don't feel good about yourself they don't like it anymore and it's fucking horrible but I was doing all that and the, the thing I the thing I hated was the whole approaching demonstrating value so I thought in my head I was like I always like stand up but in my head I was like well if I can go on stage and be funny then I've done that blanket to the whole room I've basically carpet bomb, do you know what I mean? I've just like that's like mass marketing, do you know what I mean? And then I can go out and just fucking I've done I've done the hard job then. So that was kind of I remember that was the thing that got me to sign up for the comedy course. But then, you know, when you do something, you think, oh, what the fuck have I done here? Why have I done this? And I thought, I'm gonna tell everyone, I'm gonna tell everyone because I can't shit out. So I can't, so I told everyone I knew. Uh and I was, got to get to the show and it was like 300 people and all the way through this course we'd been in a little fucking box room and I hadn't been able to get a joke out and I was thinking fucking and everyone's looking at me oh, it's going to be bad this it's going to be bad and I knew kind of what I wanted to say but everyone was like this is going to be bad this and I went on and I fucking smashed it something came out of me so I just came to life and I remember walking off the stage and Chris Cairns who'd done the um, who'd like taught the course I was like where the fuck did that come from they let me run over by about five minutes and I just I was just done boss now if I look back at the set it was shit comedy do you know what I mean like my opening joke was hey fucking hello I don't even tell them these lights but I'm the G word gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that from the game? <laughs> that fucking best opening joke ever it was a friendly crowd I always remember the fucking uh, the second time I ever done it or the third time it was like a gong show it was a much much more a much more uh, normal comedy card and I did that joke and some girl went fuck off and it killed me I died on my ass um, how is it if you don't get laughs? not as bad as you think why? I don't think because it's it's very freeing to be honest it's I mean I'm not going to say it's a nice experience but it's very freeing because the, the thing you're always trying to do is that it, it, it's it's always the goal for that not to happen so you got, always kind of got in your head or you can always feel the room you got you, it's like a balancing act where you're going all right i'm in control of this i'm in control of this i'm in control of it and it's always the fear and um, but when it so when it happens and you're not it's not hurting you and you're not dying it's it's like you kind of you, you kind of go all right well the worst happened now I'm, I'm 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 in limbo here i'm in free fall just enjoy it so i say and you just do it it, 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 the last time it happened it was a while a while ago the last time it happened to me 
was this fucking weird charity gig I got roped into by fucking Adam Rowe. <laughs> uh, he couldn't make it apparently and then I got there and I was like oh I fucking I don't know why you couldn't make this yeah. <laughs> and he had the fucking little, little PA fucking thing um, it, it, after people couldn't hear me bright room and I was thinking oh fucking hell. and I started and I tried I do stuff fucking so I just me I just said the most fucking horrible stuff I just literally much like a therapy set I just told them all kinds of mad stuff about myself wasn't even trying to be funny just literally for us i'm just gonna tell these the fucking weirdest stuff i was like i've been watching tranny porn lately and shit mm. like this and you were just fucking people were just staring at me like what the fuck is happening and i, <laughs> felt, and I found it like i walked off and i felt like i felt like a weight had been lifted mm. and i really wanted to like I I, I I always think back to that experience because i was like that was something that is something everyone thinks is gonna be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. And it's just it's not. The the worst ones are like the worst gigs are those fucking ones where you just do all right. Like you just like the crowd's a bit meh and you just go you come off and you do all right and it's like wading through mud and you get there, but it's just like you've carried them on your back for the whole thing. They're the most draining. They're, What's your worst experience? doing comedy yeah um, well I'm going to contradict myself you know because it is the first time I ever died on my ass in fucking Scotland um, Edinburgh Festival semi-finals is so you think you're funny 11 hours on a fucking coach all the way up sat next to the fucking this fucking smelly bastard and uh, got there show was about half 11 at night and I got on stage and very quickly realised that all these Americans in this audience did not understand jokes about fucking old swan in Liverpool. So I started dying on my ass. And I always remember, do you ever remember a programme called Babylon 5? No. It's a sci-fi programme years ago. Mm -hmm. There was a fit woman on it and she used to use an alien. She had these things on her head. And it's fucking... I, to this day, I've never spoke to her, but I'm fucking hundred percent sure it was her. I looked into the audience and I just seen her and, and recognised her. And I had this like moment. I was like, "Fuck off!" That's the moment of Babylon Five, and the whole room silent, just staring at me. And I just seen her go. This this little, you know that little micro expression of fucking. Mm -hmm. Oh, what the fuck is going on? Why the fuck am I here? And I was like, "Oh, it just killed me inside. It just killed me." How do you deal with that then? Well, I was a bit. Do you know what? Luckily, I walked out, and. Uh, I think the best, this is probably the best thing that could have happened to me. I walked outside, I was fucking gutted. I was gutted. It was in my head, I was like, that's going to be, like, I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this. And then that's like a Peter K one, you know what I mean? And I was like, that would be me. And I, I was fucking absolutely hooped. Then I walked out and I walked out uh, and I bumped into a couple of, Keith Carter, who's a Scouse comedian who I know, and uh, Stanley McHale, a couple of other people, and Richard Herring, who's quite a famous comic. And I never, I saw him a bit like, fucking ask Richard Herring, you know what I mean? Uh, and you were like, all right, you're, I went, oh, yeah. Uh, he went, where have you been? I said, I've oh, fucking died on my ass. And he went, to, <laughs> he went <laughs> Richard Herring went, you know what you should do? And I thought he was going to give me this, like, really profound, like, comedic kind of advice. But he went, you know what you should do? You should get a T-shirt printed with all the judges on and then just jump off a bridge and kill yourself. And I just, and it was like this pause and then he laughed and I laughed. And I was just felt, felt all right. Then I just ended up going out and have a bevy with them. And it turned out to be quite a nice night because I thought I was, I'd been out for a pint with Richard Herring and I was quite happy mm -hmm. with myself. Um, and I think that was probably the best thing that could have happened to deal with it. How do you manage to stay in a craft for 12 years without not making any money and not giving up? Was that all the self-help books and all the... No. Do you know what? I think you might find this interesting. I don't, I, I, <laughs> there's a lot of contradiction in what I'm about to say. I, I did stand up for the first, up until about, so start 2006 up to 2009. I did quite well, end up on the telly in 2007. Then I got some, I got into Jonglers, which was one of the, I mean, Jonglers was your living back then. It was like they had clubs all over the gaff. It's gone now. But, and it, was, it wasn't the best gigs to play, but it was a good, good living. So I was doing all right, traveling around. Wasn't making a million pound a year, but I was, I had a living for someone, I was 25, 26 at the time, and I was I was quite, like, but the road life got to me, and the novelty wears off quite quick, and I was on my own a lot of the time, and that's not particularly good for me. Um, and then, I, got, I was in a relationship that didn't, didn't really work out, and it was my fault. Like, 
I was in a relationship with another girl who was involved with comedy and I was just I was putting I was just I was in a bad place and I thought I'm just gonna fucking stop doing comedy. I'm just gonna stop. Like the, I've had enough of it now. because uh, that relationship didn't work out and I was like, I'm just gonna stop. And I went and got a job. Um and it was quite a nice job. It was because I'd done all the confidence stuff and all that. This job was helping, you know, single mums who've been out of work for 10, 15 years. It was helping them do CVs and kind of running these little courses for them. And um, was always being kind of, I'm a good writer and things like that. So I got this job, blagged me into this job. Decent, decent wage. Done that for about a year. And then at the same time, I was still a bit down and I'd got, like, I'd got into a good routine of, I was training MMA at a place called the MMA Academy. Just I was just going to do jiu-jitsu and Thai boxing and stuff like that. And I just had a dead simple routine, quite a nice life. And I was all right. I was kind of happy. Didn't even like, I was, I, I missed it a little bit, but I was like, it was never going well at the time. So I was like, it wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me. Then I bumped into a mate of mine called Phil Chapman, who, um, very good comic. And because it was still something I identified with myself, I still, whenever anyone asked me what I did, I still said I was a comedian. Just still said I was a comedian because it was just so used to saying it. And I, so, and it was, it's more interesting than the alternative. So I bumped into him and he was like, where the fuck have you been? And I was with another, my mate from the gym who I'd always told was a comedian. So I couldn't, he was like, where the fuck have you been? Why have you stopped doing stand up? And I was like, I haven't. And he was like, you have? I was like, I haven't. Because I was embarrassed. Do you know what I mean? And he was like, you can't stop it. I went, I haven't. I was doing a gig last week. And he was like, so he went, there's a new club, Hot Water, just opened. Uh, it's just a new act night. He said, just ring up. He just sign up. And he made me ring up while I was with him and sign up for this gig. Um, and I signed up for it and thought, I'm never going, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it. Never, never. <laughs> I'll just fuck, I'll get him out of my life and then I'm fucking. But then I, when it came round a few weeks later, I was in, I, I was in, the, in my garden with my mate who lived with me at the time. Just pissed. Drink, we had them little fucking as the barbecues out. Just yeah. fucking sitting drinking Fosters. Uh, and it come up as like a little reminder. And I was like, oh fuck, I'm meant to do this gig. And he went, come on, it'll be funny. It'll be funny. Come on, we're going to do it. And I was half good. So I went down. And that's the night where I was pissed and I didn't stand up for a year. And I just got up and just, I just winged the audience. And it was just, I felt dead free on the stage and it was I think what it had been before that is I started so well that I was sure I was going to be the best thing in stand-up and it gave me a bit of a I turned into a bit of a prick um, and then when it all went away I was I didn't like who I was and then when it all went away like I kind of reset me a little bit and then with this gig there was no pressure it was just a gig there was no ambition to be anything more than I was and I stayed with hot water for like 10 years and people used to come and say to me, it's it's mad that it's happened because people used to go, you need to get ground. You, you, you're too good to just be in one place. And I was like, I'm happy. I just used to host that club, go home. I had my kids, I had a nice life, just had a nice routine. And I think that's probably the happiest I've ever been. Like day to day content because work wise anyway, because there was literally no pressure. I had so much freedom to do what I wanted. They were never going to get rid of me. There was no chance of me. Like I could, I could literally get up and say what the fuck I wanted and I knew I had the freedom and because I had that freedom I was so comfortable there that I would never do badly I've ne it just wouldn't happen because I just did never put myself under that pressure so that's basically how it, it, there was not there was never much money in that do you know what I mean it was just hosting a comedy club three uh, end up seven nights a week but it's not the best club club comedies are not right living but it's not the best do you think the break from a year from it was gave you a rebranded yourself to then come out and do something different yeah i think it was necessary yeah i think it completely it because i wasn't a compare i wasn't like a i was never mm. something i was never a comic that was in the room i didn't understand the value of that um and then coming back to it and because i was resident because they made me resident and it was a small club so we had we relied on a regular audience I couldn't rely on the whole. A lot of compares will go on and kind of crowbar jokes in and crowbar the setting, and that's not that's not me slagging anyone off. That's just I, that's just a, something that you would do, but I didn't have the luxury of doing that because they'd all heard me jokes within about two or three weeks. So I had to yeah. just I, I literally had to learn to just make everything about make everything in the room and just make everything in the room. How was it when everything started to take off? All reviews came in and a bit of money. Like, how did you deal with that? Not well. Um, the second time. <sighs> Well, 
when when it went mad when the, the videos went online and it went mad and I came back off holiday. I came I'd been away from him in my sixties and I come back off holiday and took the baby to Tesco and these three lads were in Tesco and I was like they was just looking at me weird and I was thinking, fuck I'm not getting mugged in Tesco I'm like, <laughs> with the fucking baby in a trolley. And I was like and I was walking down and they were like along the next fucking just like looking at me, I was thinking, what the fuck's happening here? And then some woman stopped me and went, you're that lad off the uh, off that comedy club, aren't you? And I was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And she went, oh, can I have a picture? And I was like, yeah, all right. And then, because she'd asked, someone else asked, and someone else asked, and then the lads came over, yeah. and they were made up. And it just fucking, my head fell off a little bit with it, and I didn't even get bread in that. I, 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 I just I took the baby and got off of fucking Tesco. <laughs> and went home, and she, my missus was like, fucking where's, and I went, everyone's just gone mad in Tesco and started surrounding me. She was like, what, fuck off. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's gone a bit fucking mad. Um, and then, we did a DVD, and, I was like, no one's gonna fucking buy a DVD. So and the lad who runs the hot, hot water, my mate's called Paul as well. He was like, yeah, I reckon it'll be all right. You know, we've, we 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 just order we just order some and see how they go. And he had a little fucking thing on his iPad, so it was on one of them Shopify's. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And every time every time it popped up, we'd make a tenner. Do you know what I mean? And it was just going boop 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 boop. And I was I was like, we both sat there going fuck off fuck off and it was just bang 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 and we sold thousands of these dvds and i was thinking what the fuck and then we realized we had no infrastructure to sell thousands of dvds so we had these fucking dvds in a box coming up to fucking crimbo so we sat in this fucking like writing envelopes out fucking stacks having mm -hmm. to go around trying to force them into post boxes and shit like that and all that was fun and then i was like i'd never had money before and i made more in that two weeks than i'd made in the two previous years and mm -hmm. i was like just seeing this money going in my bank and he's like I was just laughing my head off about it and then so that was that was that was dead fun and dead dead novelty but then it, it all kind of people start treating you a little bit differently and it's like it's it's weird you start like I'm not going to say people like start asking you for stuff and stuff like that because I don't I, that hasn't really been my experience but yeah. like there's that sense of like people treat you a little bit differently when you think you've got money um, and th whether that's your perception of it or their perception or it's probably a little bit of both mm -hmm. probably somewhere in the middle um, but I started to struggle a little bit with it then and then that my relationship with my missus which was breaking down anyway broke down um, so that ended up in like a divorce and then but then obviously everyone thinks oh you fucking I, that hadn't been working for a long time and but I, I'd never wanted to be that type of person who, because I grew up without a dad and I was like, I don't want to be that type of person. But it took me to the point where, it was only at the point where I knew I could give her the house I was in, make sure she was all right for money and get myself somewhere suitable for my kids. That was the only point that I was ever comfortable to leave that relationship. But obviously everyone on social media and everything's going, oh, you made a bit of money and fucked you fucked your fucked your missus off and all that stuff you think you're fucking and it was i was getting all that shit i think that's where my head fell off a little bit because much like stuff that you've said you, although you know it's not true you think fucking I'll have, has my head fell off am i doing that you do question yeah. yourself a little bit with it do you know what i mean the journey's the best thing see like the first two years when i was doing this on the road and sleeping in the car sometimes because yeah. I, I couldn't afford hotels and i missed that yeah the grind the hustle nobody knew who i was and you say that working you could do that yeah tonight. i know yeah i know but i know it's, it's fucking weird even now that i think man you've got it good now yeah and it and because i know how much money can be made as well well then i think don't fucking stop then yeah because then i think that it's just crazy the constant battle the it's thing. not a bad thing like but i think I, that's the scary thing about like you make a bit of money and you go and obviously your expenditure goes up anyway so yeah. it's like you're not even like yeah. <laughs> and then you go I oh, fuck I need to keep on making this much money now and I I can't I, it, it, that's a it's, that's a weird it's a weird thing about people yeah. say like my little brother he's he's just got a normal job and he's like no, he's quite a happy guy. Do you know what I mean? Lucky bastard. You know, he is. <laughs> and he, he's proper sign. He's a bit of a potter, but he's he's, yeah. he's quite a happy guy. He's got his dogs and then he's he's a, he's a happy guy. Um, but on paper, you would look at us and you go fucking hell, he's smashing it. Like, yeah. but on paper, he's technically richer than me because you just leverage debt. Do you know what I mean? You just like you mm. take on houses and mortgages and car finance and all this kind of stuff, yeah. and it's just it's tethering you a little bit and again I'm not going to complain about it because I'm, I'm I'm in a, a very fortunate and blessed position yeah same man I don't want to sound like a miserable bastard it's just because 
I'm craving more. I don't know if it's because yeah. I'm greedy. I don't know what it is I'm craving. Because everything that I've ticked off, it's not. Well, you wonder that about like yeah. Jeff Bezos and that where you think like you, know you got I mean? seventy, you, you got like forty billion. Yeah. At what point do you stop? But you see them standing next to each other. You've got Zuckerberg, yeah. you've got the <laughs> Amazon guy, you've got Tesla guy, like, and there's, there's like, no Rolexes or no nah. APs, no Lamborghinis. Like that, they're just at that point you don't need. They it, don't yeah. give a fuck. So <laughs> that's when I know I'm still at that point where I kind of want to be accepted and kind of still show off there's no I've still got the ego there there's no yeah, yeah. bullshitting about it like I still want to it does make me feel good sometimes but then other times it gets me down so it's, yeah. maybe I should just go do you know what fuck it enjoy it do I, you know what I mean that, as that's well? the point I'm at now I, and I've, I've started just about started to feel comfortable enough to show off um, and I think I, I think I had a dead interesting conversation with a guy um, who he's a billionaire Um He's, he's a fan like, and we just got chatting and then it, you would never know you would just let never know he owns a lot of land in Liverpool um, and such a nice guy and we sat we sat and had a little and I knew he was into property and stuff so I, was, I said oh, can we have a little chat about it? like I don't know where to put my money like, so we said yeah 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 but I didn't know to what extent and then mm. I sat down and he started he was like oh. he said how are you finding the money in there and I said oh. I said I'm not going to lie I've, I've, I've being a bit silly, I bought like watches, and he went. Oh, yeah, everyone does the same thing. He went. I've had to say. He went because he, he knew Bugsy Malone, you know the rapper. Yeah, he's good he went, guy. I went. He went. I've, I've had the same conversation with him as well. He said, "You go through the phase." He said, "I remember when I got I got my because uh, uh, it, it was his granddad's. Got, he went. I remember when I was eighteen, and I got my trust fund through when I bought a yellow Lamborghini and stuff like that. And I was fucking buying all this stuff. He said, "Now I just wear these H and M T shirts." He said, "All the watches." And he said, "The only thing," and he had this a uh, like Cartier gold Cartier watch, which just wasn't even like polished or nothing. It was just like mm -hmm. nice, a nice looking watch, but you would never notice it. He went to uh, he said that like that's that's all I have now. Uh, he went, "Oh, that's nice." And he went, it was "JFK's watch that." And I was like, fuck it up. But you would just grand. never know. Yeah. He, he went, you just, like, no Scally's going to look at that. Mm. He said, you've got that date on your arm. Every Scally's going, fucking. And, and yeah. Yeah. Have you got so, a drug dealer, drug dealer yeah, chat? Yeah. 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 He's doing CIA. Oh, yeah. well, if you see something yeah, good, if you're automatically yeah. thinking he's selling yeah, gear, I still get it. Yeah, you've not stopped. And, you think, fuck me. Part of me thinks, have I stopped? But like, I, I still question what I'm doing, even though like, that's what, because that's the way people think. I don't want them to think that. I want them to see success and hard work, and I want people to, I want to lead by example where people go, do you know what? If he can do it, then I can do it. But I yeah. don't want them, I don't want to promote it I as. I think most people do think that, though. I think that the only people who, the people who say that kind of stuff are people who can't, like, can't accept that you can do that without doing. Yeah. that do you know what I mean it's just it doesn't make any sense to them but it's just the closed mindset that you can you can yeah. you can do positive things and reap the reap the rewards what was the story mean? with the busies and you's had the app and you's get fucking raided oh man fucking <laughs> we, 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 we can't we we uh, well it was in lockdown wasn't it and fucking we were because we have the streaming service we just started playing old mm -hmm. shows just to keep the streaming service going and someone reported us so the fucking 27 busy turned up but we, we thought that we were going to announce a lockdown again last week for, for New Year's Eve so we had last New Year's Eve show ready to set up because we fought off we get if we can get them to raid us again because that went like international news that it was on fuck it, it was on the news in America and everything it's fucking great <laughs> such good market <laughs> can't believe somebody stuck you in man but that's funny so the busy's raided the place and there was nobody there yeah it's fucking it's weird stuff like that it's like like what happened you no, know, with these uh, like the COVID passport shit yeah. and all that which we never we were never involved with they, there was like a testing trial that they asked us to do a show at the Echo Arena and we were like we, they, they, the lads got, got got involved but then it got like because we were the first one we got like falsely advertised as like covid passports and it was mm -hmm. all this mad fucking uproar and we were getting death threats and shit for like a couple of days and we pulled straight out of it because it wasn't us and we'd never do that that's not not something we were about but um in a weird turn of events i've been trying to get a fucking blue tick on instagram simply because i was getting loads of scam accounts made of me every and people were like fucking losing money off there because we just get loads of scams every time i posted it, it was just like oh you've won five thousand pound give us your bank details and some daft cunts would do it do you know what i mean yeah i still get that facebook people it, doing that yeah, shit yeah. me bastards it's, yeah it's fucking horrible so i was just like i was trying to get verified and verified for ages and they were like no because you got no media coverage you got no media coverage 
Uh, and it was just that news report because they put this fucking horrible thing about COVID passports and a picture of me on stage. And I was at the time, I was like, why the fuck am I on it? Mm-hmm. It's nothing to do with me. Like, I haven't, I, I'm just fucking, that's, why have you put my picture on it? But then from Blue Tick the next day. And I was like, oh, well, that's fucking yeah. in a weird roundabout way. That's it's mad out. as well. The, the blue tack <laughs> thing as well. That I chased that and chased yeah, it and chased it. And then you get it. After that day, you think, what was that? Why was this chasing that for so long? <laughs> like, all these things that people think that's where you're going to feel great in life. It's all bullshit. No. It's so much bullshit. Why did you start? Why did you want to take? Do you, have you tried ayahuasca yet? No, I haven't had the chance to try ayahuasca yet. Um, why well, did you do it DMT I don't know you're in a bad place no I actually wasn't in a bad place and I'd never done any psychedelics before but a mate of mine who is he's like a psychologist so I I, I mean I tell a story this is the end of my show now is the story of me doing DMT for the first time Um and he's just said, I've got some there if you want to try it and he said I think the thing that got me with DMT he said it's like five minutes five minutes and the, just the curiosity of that I was like all right, well, that's five minutes because the thing with mushrooms and stuff that I'd always been scared of is if I, I laughed them and go, oh, and then you fucking 12 hours in it, like, oh no, shit, what the fuck, can't get out of this now. Mm-hmm. But with the DMT, I was like, five minutes, I can handle that. And I had, just had a dead good experience on it. I just had a really positive, like, experience with it. And it, it, it shook me a little bit for a few days, but, um, yeah, I had a dead good time with it. And, like, I found that I think. <laughs> To call them drugs is wrong, I think, because I've done drugs and I don't think it's the same thing. I think DMT, weed, all the mushrooms, they are kind of, they shift your perception of things where it's like MDMA, cocaine and yeah, stuff like that. They shift your yeah. emotional state in your head and the perception of the world is still the same. I think DMA as well, they say there's a lot of positives that it's used. All, all plants used in a correct way. Yeah. I believe there's there's some sort of Definitely. medicine in all these different plants, like cocaine, heroin. That like, it's the way they're mixed yeah, to yeah. poison the the mind. That like, yeah. that I believe and everything grown from the earth is can be a positive if used correctly. That like, there's hundreds of thousands of plants on this planet for them to bring two plants together and create like ayahuasca. That is, yeah, is is mad. Like when I done ayahuasca, like, I was in hell. I was in fucking hell. Like a lot of just fire. I used to look up, look through my arms because I was fucking scared, man. Yeah. They kept telling me to go towards the pain, go towards the pain. And I'm thinking, I'm going <laughs> fucking nowhere. You see man. my pain, I'm going nowhere, man. <laughs> it's like flames. And um, I used to see people dancing and that, and I used to get envious. Yeah, I used to get envious, and I think who the fucking they dancing? And I, I, used to, I was in impossible. pain, they kept rub, like, rubbing my heart with, and then I was thinking, this is like a cult, like I'm going to get shagged in here. Like they could fucking, they could pump you and you wouldn't know yeah. what was happening, man, because you're fucking it was the balls, serpent. man, yeah. It wasn't you, it was a serpent, big fucking Mexican hanging out your ass. Like. It's give me, an, it give me a, it give me another perception on the weed and stuff, because like, I think what they do is, like if you have mushrooms or DMT, Mushrooms and DMC, I think, take you to the same place, and they're very similar experiences. Mushrooms is just slower; it's 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 a more subtle version of it, and it's a more sensory. You, you, you can spend more time there, so you can move between this and that, um, and it, it kind of shifts your reality, it shifts your perception of what's happening. I think it's always happening. You just see energies and stuff. I think I've got a lot of nice paintings in mind, like abstracts and stuff. Yeah, um, and you can see the paintings. They they dance when you're on mushrooms and it, like that wouldn't move do you know what I mean like they've got like kids toys and it's like made in China or whatever there's no life in it and I, I, I'm kind of looking at that going alright well I can see the energy in that and weed as well I think the problem the problems people have on weed and the reason like people say it causes mental health problems I don't think particularly that does and it's just my theory but just from my own experiences when people smoke too much weed whenever you smoke weed you shift your you shift your perception to a slightly different realm so that's why you know when you when, when you're on weed you have these weed thoughts and you make total fucking sense to you and then when you sober up you try and tell someone about it i write jokes all the time i used to when i was on weed and i was like makes it's not funny it doesn't make any fucking sense it does but not in this like kind of mm-hmm. reality and in that reality it makes it makes sense and i think 
if you can just shift your perception over a little bit from time to time, it's very helpful. They, they kind of complement each other. But when you smoke weed every day, when you're getting up in the morning, you're just smoking weed in the morning, just smoking weed all day. You spend so much time in that reality that when you try and come back into this one, it's so jarring to you that that's where the mental health problems and the paranoia and that come in because it doesn't make any real sense to you when you start sobering up. So you try and get back to there because it's where you feel more comfortable. Yeah. And I'd never really seen it that way until I did the mushrooms. Because I would never get up in the morning and take mushrooms, you know what I mean? I would never do it. But I found every time, every experience I've had on mushrooms has been really profoundly positive. And I felt great after it for a few days. And since then, I use the weed in a very similar way. So I, I use, I'll, I'll have two bits of weed. I'll come up and I'll use it for something. I'll sit and I'll write or I'll sit and I'll do something. I'll try and get something out. And I won't go back again. Because I feel like the more time you spend there, the more damaging it is. But it can be, it's, it's, if if you just use it to as as the tool it was intended, it can be very very positive For and very helpful. Mindset, yeah. when you look at guys like Tupac, Big like all the great rappers, like they all smoke a lot of weed because it feels after they're at their most creative. Yeah. But for me, I couldn't have one joint, two joints. But yeah. I'm I'm all or nothing because it's so good not being in real life. Yeah. Because it's just vegetating. But then I used to look at myself and I think you look. Fuck, I used to go grey. <laughs> like you do change colour you change fucking colour like you haven't no been outside like, for yeah, three weeks you just don't change <laughs> colours and I just I just because I'm lazy anyway mm. so if I'm doing all that stuff I'm just nowhere to be seen and I and life, listen life is amazing I, I feel good I feel blessed yeah. but I still got to force myself to get up I've got to force myself to hit the road again and, and, and drive hundreds of miles to hit certain targets and, and be two or three weeks ahead of the game like the, this is between Christmas and New Year now Everybody's partying. I'm working. Yeah. I'm here smashing out four podcasts in two days. Like I'm already ahead of the game in January when everybody else is still trying to catch up. That's my method of thinking. Like I want to be the biggest on the planet. For me to do that, I've got to work harder than the rest yeah. and distance myself from everything that they can't do and achieve. Like me, it's a fucking lonely road. And I always say this, it's so lonely, like being on the road, but I just know what it brings to the family. Like we're going on holiday again in six weeks. Like I can fuck it. I've got freedom. Yeah. But to keep the freedom up, I've still got to bust my balls. Like I'm not at that stage where I've got the fuck you money and I can just leave things. Listen, in two or three years, it's, it's going to come. I might become a cunt. I might be driving the fucking <laughs> Orange Lambo and smoking DMT in the living room, not giving a fuck. Like, I just feel as if I've constantly got to work. Like, I want nice things. Like, I want beautiful cars. I yeah. love a Rolls Royce. That like, I'm not there yet, but I will have it. Doesn't mean I'm a bad guy, but it doesn't no. mean I wake up coming in my pants every day that I've got. A, nice watches or Rolex or whatever cars and whatever house it's not where I feel I, no, I think you do if, if it comes as a byproduct of this yeah. that's then what that's, that's fine yeah. do you know what I mean it's just to enjoy the small moments yeah. of it and be grateful for it yeah. and not understand that it's not going to heal all your pain no it, it, it can't yeah. because that's just I, it's just it. it's impossible to be happy all the time anyway yeah, like, it doesn't exist it's just not doesn't, no, I not feel it's, happy Half an hour after the gym. Yeah. Yoga or cold water therapy. When I'm with the kids, listen, I, I, when I'm with my kids, it's not as if I'm happy because I'm constantly on fucking edge and they do my head in. They just fight like fuck. So it's not as if people see all oh, my kids make me happy and I'm thinking, <laughs> you're lying, you bastard. <laughs> like, people around, don't worry, oh, my kids and my family make me happy. Like, out for Christmas dinner, just all arguing and fighting. Yeah. I'm thinking, I just wanted to go fucking home. <laughs> You should do my fucking head in and people say, oh, it's family time, Christmas. I'm thinking, fuck them, man. Give yeah. me some ice water, man. Bit of DMT, a <laughs> few mushrooms, bit of smack and fuck everybody else, in it. <laughs> How have you dealt with but all, like, everything, with your mindset and constantly try to sometimes battle to get away, but then to get your level, man, it's unbelievable what you've achieved. Like, you can't fucking fault that. Like, how have you dealt with it now, though? Like, you're at the peak of your game. Like, everybody knows who you are and you're doing great. Um, I'm dealing with it a lot better now. I, I, I it's I still have problems. Like I, I, I filmed a, I filmed a little vlog, like this year. I filmed all the shows behind the scenes, and we filmed them on, put them out on YouTube and stuff. And I think people have enjoyed that because I've been very open on it. Like, and with the ups and the downs, and I, again, like you say before, people think dying on your ass is is the worst thing. Is that it's not. It's like it's doing like. I did two shows in Newcastle, and Newcastle is amazing. Do you know what I mean? City Hall, so we've got two, two, near two and a half thousand people in both nights, rammed. They're good crowds, loads of energy in there, absolutely amazing. And you do these things, and you hit that high, and you come off, and that's the that's for me. That's like that's the best drug for me. It's like 
you can't i've never had anything that will match that level of when you're smashing a gig for like when you've got that cr- cr- crowd and you can do anything with them and you're smashing that gig for an hour and a half and you come off i've got a stand innovation and i've, I've got it all on tape and it looks fucking incredible do you know what i mean and then i got home and i just sat there and i just felt fucking awful and of course i'm gonna film this because People, I think, I think people will find it interesting. So I just got the camera and I just had a little chat to the camera and I was just felt like suicidal is probably a strong word, but I get that fucking, you know, that little fucking intrusive thought where you just got, I mean, I get it when I get a fucking parking fine or when I've got to fucking do me taxes or whatever. My brain just goes, just kill yourself. It'd be easier. Just fucking kill yourself. Just, just why don't you just kill yourself? Just kill yourself. It'd be, it'd be a lot easier. Um, that little fucking weird voice and I, so I'm chatting about that it's, like, it's, like, it's those it's not the deaths that are bad it's the it's, it's coming down from those peaks from those heights from from doing those big massive shows or as you say where you've got everything that you thought you wanted you've got everything that you thought you wanted and then as soon as a little flicker of that little depression comes back in or that little sadness or melancholy or which is bound to you go oh for fuck's sake well, what can I do what can I do because I can't possibly do better than that. I can't do better than that. I've got everything that I could ever want. I'm 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 blessed, and I I can't even moan now because I've I've literally I've achieved everything I want to achieve, and now I'm still not happy. It's a fucking slap of the slope that though. That, it is. The way you but then it comes to, back around to get well. that standing ovation to then the suicidal thoughts. Like yeah, it, and it took it was less than a day. Do you know what I mean? And I'm sat there fucking in my kitchen just on my own, depressed. Just, why is that though all comics do because that because it's got to but it, it has to go somewhere it, it this is the thing I, I don't think people really realise about like it's such an emotional high and such an energy transfer you're giving so much and getting so much mm-hmm. you, 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 it's got to go somewhere it's just yeah. literally go somewhere it, it, it's, you, you're up there you've got to come back down it's got to be a balance do you know what I mean it's got to balance out at some point and from the high anything feels low do you know what I mean when are you your happiest on stage, definitely. Is that you are? Because I say this all the time as well. When I do these podcasts, like I don't think about anything else. Yeah. This is when I'm at my happiest, and then I'll go home and drive, and I think, oh, that was a shit interview. Or I should have said this, or I should have said that. And I'm going home. I'm just going to lie in my house and on TikTok for the next five hours. Like <laughs> it's, these are. It's, it's like oh, I'll say that shit, but it's like an escape, man. Yeah. Just to be away because it's the brain can't it? multitask. It can't. Mm take you past present future it keeps me in the now mm. because i'm concentrating I'm, I'm intrigued by your words i'm mm. intrigued by what people say so i can interact with the story and take it on a journey and for people watching when they like that so I'll, I'll twist the sentences and i'll i'll take it on a different journey for people to enjoy the experience for people sitting in the living room and go fucking i enjoyed that i didn't expect yeah. that it's like a creative because i didn't know because i always crave sugar after interviews yeah and um, uh, cameraman ryan he says when i done he done a create a uh, media course he says you've got to keep um glucose tablets because your glucose levels drop that's why i crave sugar to bring up my sugar levels but that's why I, that's my excuse for eating shit yeah so that's why i always crave sugar after because you're giving so much energy towards that your levels drop and you need to pick them up again yeah. but he says if you take the glucose tablets it's not as extreme as binging on chocolate food fatty foods yeah so i didn't know that man so but i've, I've still not listened to it because after <laughs> this mate i'll get asking and drive up the road and and then i'll think right what's next yeah it's fucking nuts mate do you think we're bonkers oh, definitely and do you know what and i think we 100 percent are but i don't really want to not be i don't really like again going back to I, 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 that is what i'm scared of fixing it a little bit yeah. you feel like if I fix it and just become a well-adjusted individual I'm just I'm not going to do any of this shit you anymore you'll lose yourself if you, 100%, if you truly 100% try lose and heal yourself. that's a scary thought to have but to keep all the, the madness in this the is what I was like going back to what I said earlier about like I feel like I think this is why my body sometimes I have these long periods of like being really well adjusted having a lovely routine fucking getting cold showers breathing doing yoga and stuff like that and then my body goes that's not interesting, mate. You need to go and fucking. You need to be a mess. You need to be a yeah. mess for a little bit. You need because you need some tragedy in your life. Because tragedy is comedy. Do you know what I mean? And you need that. You need that in there. Um, I'm getting less and less now. I like. There's a bit of me show where I'm talking about it now because all my other shows have been like 
was in a relationship. I wasn't particularly happy, and, and this is not to slag my ex off at all because she's a great mum, and like we got on, we got on dead well. Now that's not what I'm here to do, but we weren't happy together. And a lot of if you look up back, back at like my first couple of tour shows, I'm jokingly slagging it off a lot, and it was like veiled a lot of truth is said and jest and all that shit. Whereas me misses now was amazing. Like we get on, like we get on so well, and like I was really fucking scared of that because I was like, the fuck am I gonna moan about? What am I gonna moan about on stage? But then I just went on. A, I, I'm getting more able to go on and just be open now, and just I'm. I don't want to be that fucking oh family voice or whatever. But like I'm getting more able to just go on and be myself. So I'm hoping that that gets to a point now where I can just I can be that kind of zen individual and still be funny but it, it hasn't happened yet are you scared that that doesn't happen if that i mean uh, yeah yeah but fuck it innit? fuck it fuck so, it if it does i'll just i'll i'm <laughs> i'll just fucking i i i've i've come to drugs late in life as well i think that's that's a, a thing for me so like like i hadn't had mdma until last year <laughs> you fucking love it you've mentioned off and rhymed off about five different drugs here today I, mean, I, 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 I do I love MDMA <laughs> you're starting to fucking get me excited man, again. <laughs> I'm so sorry I'll end up bang on the bag again <laughs> <laughs> just see me fucking, fucking hanging out my ass on it why do you think Liverpool like, uh, comedians in Liverpool are flying high just now man like Adam I think it's the club, me, Adam's fucking flying as well yeah, man I, well Adam started the, I, I, I hosted Adam's first gig yeah um, I honestly think it's the club. I think it's hot water. Um, it's the. I would. I would. I'd quite safely say it's the best in the country. Um, if all the comics in the comments saying fucking. I don't think many would disagree. To be honest, I mean, the, if they do, they'll be. I, the, I mean, I've been subjective. Do you know what I mean? And there's some f fantastic comedy clubs, uh, but it's it's got to be in the conversation. It's 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 just phenomenal place um and i think it's up there with one of some of the best in the world i'm seeing some of them frankie allen man they teeth and tan man and so many <laughs> like, it's all scousers man i'm seeing on like, twitter and like, yeah. instagram like, it's the thing because like it. we've got like i don't i don't like to go down the whole route of like ask oh, like ask oh, all scousers are funny and all that stuff I, I don't like because i don't think that's naturally i i think any port town because I think it's the same as Glasgow it's the same as Newcastle same as the same as Belfast same as Dublin same as that those places where you've had a lot fucking lot of people mashed together and you've had to get along that humour comes out because it's the best way to break the ice with fellas do you know what I mean just yeah. fucking have that humour so I think there's a lot of, a lot of that going about um, but I think having this club here working we, what's happened is we've got me Adam you've got Danny Mack you've got Freddie we've got Phil we've got like all these all these acts who are having to be on the same bills as each other got like Troy Ork who, 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 Milo plays Troy Ork you've got all these people who are top of the game so to be on the bill with them you got to be as good as them or, or better and then so I, I'll push myself to get a little bit better than Adam goes alright well I've got to follow that so because we all switch around on the bill so we've got mm. to be able to follow each other you can't be like you just can't not have that ability to do that. So then I, I have to follow Adam. He has to follow me. I, I have to follow Adam. He has to follow me. So we're just pushing each other up in that way. Yeah. And it's just like, it's, it's just training with better people in it. How are you dealing with the cancel culture? I don't particularly get bothered by it that much simply because no one really, I, I'm not a particular, although I, I'm only, re, I am edgy and I'm very graphic, but I'm only, I, I only ever talk about myself. Uh, the only thing I've ever had the problem with is people saying I shouldn't talk about my son being autistic on stage, but I just told them to go and fuck themselves because I was talking about my experience of having an autistic son, so they can, like, I'm, I wasn't talking about the experience of being autistic. I'm talking about my autistic, and I've had so many autistic pa parents of autistic kids come to me and say it was, I, it's fucking hard being the parent of an autistic kid, and it gave them, a, it, it was able to make them laugh, so I don't give a fuck about that. But I'm quite a lucky position where I'm not on telly. I haven't got an agent. It's hard to cancel me because if 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 they wanted to, because I, they can't really take it away from me because I, I, they're not going to stop me playing the club. The people who come and see me decide to come and see me. I'm not offend. I'm, I, 
I'm not really that offensive to be honest. Yeah, it's fucking embarrassing anyway. It, for it, me, it, it's comedy, it's comedy, man. It should, it should be a free for all. I'm very dark humoured anyway. I, yeah. I like dark stuff. I, I, I like genuinely dark stuff. doing that because it's it's so fucked up. It's funny. <laughs> and you, you oh, like obviously you get Dave Chappelle when that Americans like he kinda just went all out there on his last show on Netflix yeah. and do you know what? Fair fucking play that. Well, like he's comedy. yeah, I, I I thought his last show was great. Uh, yeah. I thought I thought it, he's he's so clever that he made he made the show about he made the show about people getting offended who won't have seen the show mm -hmm. and people got offended who hadn't seen the show and I thought that was that that's like that's like next level masterpiece stuff. Yeah, uh, but it's it must become a lot of pressure on some comics. Like comedians people are to, scared to I like, then be sitting on the fence, but then you're not really a, a true comedian for me. For me, it's never lose that, never lose you. Like, I had Dapper Laughs on and he'd done a joke yeah. and he had to go and say sorry about it in front of millions of people and yeah. I, I kind of thought and he knows this now but like saying sorry and stuff kind of then sorry for what? You made a joke mm. and they, they tried to twist it and stuff and um, it obviously just backfired on him and it kind of destroyed he destroyed himself went off the rails but now he's back thankfully because fucking good guy but yeah. I think apologising for certain things just then it admits defeat like uh, you're, a, you're a comedian you're, uh, you're supposed to say fucked up shit yes yeah, some people's not going to like it all that like, Frankie Boyle says a lot of shit and I think it's a wee bit too much but <laughs> it's just his fucking nature isn't it? it's just it, 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 well every it's all perception and everyone gets offended by something I I mean it's very hard to offend me but if like going back to like if someone went on stage and started being horrible about autistic kids I'd probably wouldn't enjoy it but I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna try and cancel them because I mm. understand. I've got a good understanding of comedy yeah. and I understand intention as well. Like they're not particularly. If they're just going on and trying to be a cunt for the sake of being a cunt and they're not funny, that's the that's the biggest thing that offends me. If it's not funny, then yeah. it's that, that. But if someone says something funny, then I will yeah. laugh. There's always mean? going to be something that's that that hits that hits a nerve. Like, uh, like, yeah. be, like Frankie Boyle stuff with the the same, with the Harvey thing. Like I don't personally like that but you'll still think fucking that's sick but people will laugh like there's, there's sick yeah. jokes I'll laugh at other people won't laugh at mm. so it's, everybody's just different it's just yeah. let them be who they want to be if you but, don't if you don't like agree with what they say don't fucking watch them well like a, a good example of this the closest I've been to getting into any shit over the last tour was this um, is a clip of me at the start of my Birmingham show talking to a guy in the front row talking to his daughter and she was nice and I said uh, uh, what's your name and he's like Aid and I said oh what you do Aid and he went oh not much and I'd already talked to a fellow who's retired so I went oh you're retired like this lazy fucker and he went no I've got cancer right <laughs> so I just fucking went <laughs> on him I went oh fucking hell dice one for fucking ruining the show yeah. Aid fucking hell let's all go on about Aid's uh -huh. cancer and I just gave him a load of shit but luckily uh, it, and it, in the room it went off like it was fucking mm -hmm. everyone I think I've seen, I've seen that themselves. actually um, and luckily I had the crowd shot and so you can see him and his missus and his kids laughing the fucking heads off at it. Mm -hmm. And I just proper went, on, oh, we've seen you on Facebook. Oh, it's back. It's malignant. Mm -hmm. Oh, shut the fuck up, babe. Yeah, yeah, and give him a load of shit about it. And I come off the stage and I was like, fuck it out. And I, I messaged Rudy, he does all the film. I went, did you get that? And he went, yeah, yeah. God, I was like, thank fucking. And I was like, oh, was it too far? And he was like, I don't know, but like, I'm going to have to watch it back. And, but, and I was watching it back in the break, thinking, fucking hell, it's going to be a good clip. This going to mm -hmm. be a good clip. And then, I got. I, I went on my phone because I was about to ring the guy to say oh, I've just fucking the maddest things just happened, and uh, I had a message of his daughter saying thank you so much for that. Like that's the first time we've felt normal in a long time, and he, and he messaged me as well saying oh thanks oh, and I, I and that that sealed it for me because yeah. I thought like and I got I've had a load of shit in the comments of it that's fucking taking the piss out of people with cancer because they're not really I'm not do you know what I mean they're not yeah. really listening they're not watching it they're just hearing the word cancer and mm -hmm. thinking I'm being a cunt. And I mean, we didn't help that by putting the caption too far on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fucking comedy. But that's it, where the comedy is beautiful. It, if you can yeah. take something serious and turn it into a joke, then for yeah. me, that's comedy. All I was asked about in that situation was he had a good night there. Yeah. He, that man has sat there. He's he's got cancer. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't need me fucking making the whole room feel tense about it. Do you know what I mean? He's brought it up. That's the best thing I could have done in the situation, and he was fucking made up about it. And I thought that's all. That, that's that's comedy for me. Do you, do you question know? that sometimes though when you walk off and you think, I'd, "Fuck." Do you know what? I, afterwards, after the fact, because it's the same as anything to me. Mm -hmm. All the stuff we've said today, it's like you, we all have that brain when we, we're second guessing ourselves all the time. 
but I knew it was the right thing to do because I did it in the moment. In that moment, I felt the tension in the room and I broke it. Do you know what I mean? And I broke it and I made, I kept everyone laughing, which was my job. Everyone's paid. I've got a thousand people there paid to see me mm-hmm. and for me to make them laugh all night. Do you know what I mean? They're all going through their own stuff. Everyone's going through their own stuff in life. Yeah. And that's my job to just take them out of that for an hour and just make them laugh and make them feel a bit better. Um, and I did that for him. And he probably, he, he, I, well, I know because he said in the message, he said that's the most he's laughed in as long as he could remember you know yeah. what I mean? and I thought well that's if, even if everyone calls me a cunt on the internet that's worth it just mm-hmm. for him who do you look up to as a, a comedian is there anyone that stands out you, you look up to as and go um, I don't know it's a tough question uh, I, 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 it's, it's the question you've got to give a lot of thought to as a comedian because you do get asked it quite a bit mm. and I, I don't think I ever really realised but I've not given it a lot of thought I think and looking at my style when I do material I remember, I didn't have the best relationship with my dad, but I remember when I was a kid, one of the, the little lasting things I can remember is he put me, he get me, me and our kid, when we stay in his, me and our kid, they go to bed and then he'd let me get back up after our kid, they go to sleep. And we watched Doctor Who and then we watched Dave Allen. And I always remember they laughing at Dave Allen. I don't think I fully understood what I was laughing at at the time, but I think I took a lot of his cadences on and a lot of the, his style of like storytelling. Because I tell really long form really detailed stories I try and get the most out of it mm-hmm. and I've watched back and Dave Allen if no one's seen him is I, I I don't think he gets credited with it but I think he is the father of modern British stand-up because the, he did stand-up in a different way to everyone else it was just stories and it was just beautiful beautiful stories his, his bit of stand-up about teaching the kids to tell the time is fucking phenomenal if you haven't seen it get it on YouTube yeah, it's well. so good um, so I, I always say I'd have to say Dave Allen yeah where do you go now? Like you're at the top of your game. Like you're loved all over now. You're selling out arenas. What's the plans, brother, for the future? Um, just mate, just carry it on. Just I, uh, I work. Well. I do want to do a bit more. I'm in talks with um, a mate of mine about doing a, making a film, um, possibly just self producing a little. So I want to try and do something. I dabbled with a little bit of acting, um, and I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah stand up wise just I, I'm happy with what I'm turning out to admit I'm happy with this li- this latest show that's just coming to an end this tour it's definitely the best I've ever done um, I'm happy with how I'm, I'm I'm quite prolific on stage at the minute and I'm just yeah so in that regard just keep on going because the shows I'm playing are just amazing and everyone seems quite positive about it so yeah when you're in Glasgow March fucking hell no July mate what happened oh fucking don't get me started. Fucking, well, it got postponed and postponed, didn't it? And when the Kings, which is probably one of my favourite venues, yeah. um, and it just couldn't get a fucking date. So we got moved to like July next year, which is like the tour ends in February mm-hmm. and then I've got them two fuckers out in July. So I don't even know what's going to happen. It's probably, that'll end up probably be in the first date of the next tour now. Yeah. We've got two sold out shows. In- but it's fucking unbelievable. What is that, two and a half thousand now? Uh, no. What, what is it in the Kings? A fucking... I want to say 1700 that's fucking good amazing hopefully uh, Glasgow fucking <laughs> first place I ever got terrified we did the theatre was at the theatre royal innit to the other side yeah and yeah fucking, yeah, yeah. It comes out the side door it's the first place I've ever thought fuck I might need security yeah. when, and they were all dead positive but like they're coming out there and I've come out the side door and they've all gone hey fucking and they pick me up and fucking carry me down the street and I was like <laughs> and I was you know you're kind of laughing along with you yeah. think if these don't stop I can't stop them do you know what yeah. I mean I'm done here but they just fucking drop me off by the little there's a little whiskey bar called yeah. the pot still I think the glass regions in the schools are kind of like yeah kind of definitely. fucked up in the head like yeah. sick sense of humour like yeah. it's a good bond like kind of zero fucks given mentality yeah. wild yeah. but they fucking show you a lot of love if they support you man like they're yeah. right behind you and that's yeah. a good thing like but for what you're achieving bro it's unbelievable yes you've got your struggles and battles like fucking every single yeah. person like you're not shying away from them. We're constantly searching to try and fix them. Well, we'll ever fix That's them. That's the thing, isn't it? You gotta look at you gotta look at them things in the mirror yeah. and just fucking try and embrace them and yeah. just understand them about yourself. It's mad, but in that life, the experience, the journey. But for anybody that's maybe going through some sort of struggles at now, what advice would you have for them? Um, if anyone's going through, <sighs> that's a tough one. I think. Don't rush, I think is the best advice I could give. Like, try and simplify. If you're really struggling, you really feel down, I think just try and simplify as much, just try and strip everything back 
and just go back to the start. It's it's never too late to just go back to the start and just just start try and find something that you you take some kind of pleasure in, and like something that you get some value from. Like like me with comedy or you with this. Do you know what I mean? There's been points in your life where you, I imagine you've been sat there thinking, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to yeah. do. I could never imagine you were going to be doing this. Do you know what I mean? And if someone would have said to you, oh, you're going to get a couple of microphones and some and some cameras and travel around talking to people and millions of people are going to watch it, you'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Do you know what I mean? It would have made no sense to you. So like, just because the answer's not apparent or you can't see the way out doesn't mean there's not a way out or it just doesn't mean there's not a lot of positivity in your future. So just take your time with it, simplify it, try and, try and get yourself healthy and then just opportunities yeah. will come up what's your social media links brother for people it's um, what, at Paul is the Joker on Instagram um, and yeah for any tickets and stuff just hotwatercomedy.co.uk you'll leave all the links in the description uh, yeah and uh, you can check uh, my little podcast out with Mrs. What's the Story Paul seen a couple yeah. couple of fucking she's fucking, psychos she's fucking funnier than me oh. um, dead good talk to you, for coming you on so today bro and telling your story you're a genuine guy good guy I wish you all the best for the future and look forward to coming to one of your shows, bro. Yes, me. Nice God one. bless you, Thank brother. Thank you.